Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the seventh presentation in this semester's Perspective of Global Development Seminar Series. Uh, I'm Terry Tucker. It's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Brown Goberts. Brown currently holds the prestigious Andrew D. White Professorship, Professorship at Large at Cornell University. And in this, uh, for those who uh, uh, don't know about that uh, professorship, it's uh, a distinction granted to individuals who work in the sciences, in education, social sciences, literature, creative arts, uh, all the things that we do here at Cornell uh, has had great impact and in international visibility. And following his sixth year appointment, which uh, uh, I think you're about halfway through, uh, 80 white professors at large are considered distinguished lifetime members of the Cornell University academic community. And Dr. Gobert's appointment as an AD white professor at large reflects his widely recognized contributions to global agriculture and food system innovation. In his day job, he serves as Director General of the International Maize and Weed Improvement Center, CIMIT, uh, one of the world's leading agricultural research and development institutions. There he's been instrumental in assembling effective multidisciplinary science and development teams to generate innovation and change in agriculture and food systems across the world. These initiatives have resulted in improved nutrition and national and international resilience and food security across the world. Uh, in 2014, Brown received the Normandy Borlaug Award for Field Research and Application, uh, an award endowed by the Rockefeller Foundation uh, awarded by the World Food Prize Foundation for finding innovative ways of applying science to improve the productivity and resilience of small and medium-sized maize and wheat farmers in Mexico. He was Is very recently elected a fellow in the American Society of Economy, uh, that organization's most prestigious recognition. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to your talk. Thank you. First of all, thanks uh, everybody for showing up. Uh, to this uh, to this uh, to this seminar, uh, those on, online cannot see, but we have an almost full uh, room, all masked up. Uh, I'm not wearing my mask just for clarity uh, of the pres of the presentation. For those in the room that cannot see online, we have over 120 people now uh, connected uh, online. So everybody, thanks for uh, joining. I know uh, you can do others other things during these uh, 45 minutes. So so thanks for sparing that. I also deeply want to thank uh, Cornell. Uh, I'm humbled by the um, recognition received, and that wouldn't have been possible uh, by thanks to sponsors or, or supporters like some of them in the room. So Johannes, thanks a lot for, for doing that, but also Ronnie uh, and many others that have been uh, uh, compagnon de route, de route in these uh, adventures, and I hope uh, will uh, we'll still be that. Also, I want to deeply thank my uh, colleagues at CIMIT. The presentation I'm going to give is uh, including material from colleagues uh, in CIMIT. So that also means there are going to be a couple slide, slides where I'm going to be on very thin ice. And I will also indicate that uh, because it's those slides where a simple agronomist is probably a bit out of his league. But I know there's uh, smart people in the room that are going to be able to help me uh, to, uh, to understand that. So let's get, let's get this started. And, um, the original presentation title was what's leading agriculture research what's the leading agriculture research for development organization doing to help farmers to adapt uh, to climate change so the first part of the presentation is about that but given given the recent developments globally i did add a, a section specially uh, related to that and i hope you uh, will allow me uh, to, to to present some of that i think this is not working so I don't know why. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, all right. So first and foremost, what is CIMIT? CIMIT works uh, for a, a world with resilient agri-food systems and protecting the biodiversity. And we do that by uh, keeping the farmer centered and working by a fantastic theme, uh, uh, theme of scientists, not only in CIMIT, but in many, many other organizations with whom we collaborate. One of them, Cornell. We would be nothing without the fantastic collaborations throughout the network of global research. Having that said, our headquarters are in Mexico. We're active in all, almost 50 countries, and we are working 
about maize and wheat, one of the two uh, important crops that feed the world. 70% of the wheat grown globally and 50% of the maize glo grown globally, globally comes from CIMIT's efforts. And when I use the word CIMIT, I don't only mean the institution, I mean the whole network of organizations around that. So we are, as a whole, as a collective, pretty important, but also uh, we have a lot of weight on our shoulders. Let's not forget that we have a responsibility for 70% of the wheat grown globally, 50% of the maize. In whatever we do, we have to put our final stakeholder centrally. And that is those women and men on these pictures. As diverse as they are, in different climates, with different families, with one objective, feeding sustainably the world. Okay, I'm struggling a bit here. Okay, there we go. If we want to keep feeding the world, we first have to look at how many mouths that's going to be. And so we have to feed soon 690 million uh, people additionally, 8.9 uh, 8 global population today are hungry. So we're already failing this task without taking into account that global population will keep rising. So if we keep looking and projecting from the past towards the future, and we keep increasing yields as we, as we have done in the past, which is this yellow line, that will not be enough because actually if we look at population, we need to be at the green line. But it will be definitely not enough if we look at diseases, water, nutrient and energy, scarcity and climate change, because those are pushing actually those lines to this red line. So what we have to overcome is this piece here in the middle. In the nexus, therefore, of the food production, of course, sits climate change. It influences the whole system that is built around that. We need to get climate out of agriculture or climate change out of agriculture, but also agriculture out of climate change. Getting climate out of agriculture, why? Because climate is affecting agriculture to more extreme weather events, drought and flooding. But also if we don't do anything to adapt, we will lose 6% of the wheat yields and 7.4% of the maize yields globally. And this can be seen in these uh, uh, nice, uh, nice graphs, how the changing climate will affect those uh, yield gains. Very simple and well-known effects like drought or the other extreme, water logging and heat, but also a whole sweep of new diseases coming out because of those changing temperatures. It's a bit like we are creating the conditions for the next COVID disease to happen uh, through climate change, but I mean COVID for the plants, right? Which can be either uh, many of those uh, shown uh, here. But also, it's not only about the energy, it's also about the nutritional quality of the food we eat. We, eat. we want a healthy diet, which starts first and foremost with having those cereals having the right nutritional qualities. And then, of course, putting that all together with all the other products that uh, we need to have a healthy diet. If we look at climate change, it also affects the quality of wheat, rice, field peas, soybeans, maize, and sorghum. So it's not only a yield issue, it's also a quality issue. But also, we need to take agriculture out of climate change. After big oil, probably agriculture is the next sector that will be called to court of social society about its impact on climate change. We have an opportunity with all online and all sitting in the room to be before we are called to court. It's always easier if you can already say, yes, I know, but I already did this and this and this, and I will do even more this and that and that before you're sitting there. Because large, a large amount of greenhouse gases actually come from the agriculture sector. So the therefore, CIMIT is focusing on an extensive research agenda on climate change adaptation and mitigation. And we need to do even better. We need to strategize on how we can do better. And we want to strategize with you on that. A climate-focused research agenda needs to aim to help smallholder farmers to adapt to those climate shocks, but also to take out and reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. And the first step of that is probably to make the 10,000 years of past 
work for us in the future. We have a unique opportunity to change the paradigm of how we do research. Up to now, we were trying to resolve yesterday's problems tomorrow. What I mean is you observe a problem, you see the problem, you ask for money to resolve the problem, and tomorrow the result will be there. It's exactly what happened to the COVID crisis. There was a COVID crisis, we observed the crisis, we mobilized very successfully a scientific community, and we came up with the vaccines. And the focus was on, let's do it fast, the faster we can, we have the capabilities, and we are rightfully very proud of that. If you look at the climate crisis and the capabilities we have, we probably have to change that paradigm and say, can we solve today tomorrow's problem? Can we move ourselves in tomorrow's world and look what would be needed in that world? So rather than projecting from the past to the future, can we manage the present from that future? This will require, on the one hand, knowing how that future looks like if we don't do anything, but we have the models, we have the IA, we have the data, we can do that. We can also be more ambitious and accept we just don't want to accept a future projected from the past, but that we want to come together and design a better future. Those commitments in COP13, what do they really mean? Society is hearing they're going to take away my car. Society is hearing I can no longer fly to this nice island to be on vacation. It's our job to project to society a better future we can agree upon and from there work backwards. And luckily we have the past to learn from and to use. This is the biodiversity of uh, representative maize, of corn, for those uh, uh, US English speakers. And you can see it doesn't all look yellow. It doesn't all look white. It has a whole set of different colors. But colors is just one thing. Size is another one, but that's just one, an extra thing. What is inside those grains is also as diverse as those outside elements. And so that's one of the banks of the gene banks. We have maize and wheat. Yesterday, our friends from SIAT, also part of the CJR uh, network, inaugurated a new gene bank on beans. So those gene banks are actually globally available. They're a global public good. They have more than 750,000 accessions of all kinds of crops that are ready to be used, ready to be combined, like I many times say uh, to farmers, ready to be a smart woman and a handsome man and to make smart and handsome kids. But what smart and handsome means is very different for different circumstances, for different uh, uh, needs. So we have Simit with maize, we have cassava, uh, our colleagues from Seattle Biodiversity and IITA, we have cowpea, rice, iri, sorghum, uh, and uh, of course you see here uh, Cornell and other universities involved in a new project. Today, press release, uh, look it up on Simit's website about a new sprint, uh, a new aim for climate sprint that is based on a past investment from the Mexican government in seats of discovery and a current project with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And what does that project want to do? It actually wants to look at how are we breeding today and can we breed today for a future world? Because when you breed a new crop, it will take at least 10 years before it reaches a farmer, right? Because you have to go through this whole thing here and then still you have to make uh, the seeds. So can we actually change the way to, we think about that breeding? And this is where I'm starting to get on very thin ice. Just turn around here to the viewers. Help me out if I'm doing this wrong. So can we change this paradigm? And can we actually use environmental GWAS? So what that means is what we normally do is we take a genotype, we, take, we look at the genes, and we try to identify how that is connected with the phenotype, how it looks like, what it does, right? We analyze that, and we try to associate traits of interest with th that genetic uh, piece and we try to combine those genetic pieces so we have several traits that we like. I, I hope I'm still doing well. What happens if we actually make a combination between genotype and collection site or environment? What actually happens if we look more as the environment as the de a defining type and not necessarily how somebody or how the seed is looking like or what trait uh, it has? We do the analysis and we actually connect 
the genetic piece with the well behavior in an environment, knowing that future environments will change. So you actually could think, if I take a site, I design the future environment of that, if we don't do anything, I could already say, okay, if these crops are gonna go there, we need to get those characteristics in there, even if they are today not competitive. But they will be tomorrow. Does that, I hope that makes uh, sense. And so the first steps have been done. Also, thanks to some of you here in the room, thanks to the collaboration with Cornell. And this is an example of uh, a GWAS panel of, uh, of 2,700 accessions of our uh, gene bank, connected with some of those site climate data. And what it did, it did show this peak here. You see, so these are the environments. We know where they were, where they were collected. They were mapped, and you can see this peak here. And this peak here basically does represent the uh, peak that is related to a heat shock transcription factor, which actually shows, and it plays a great role in surviving in a, in a, in a heat uh, dense uh, environment. So we know we can make uh, those uh, connections. So we need to go a next step, and we did that uh, uh, with some uh, of uh, uh, the Jeff Ross Ibarra's group, and they ran another series of environmental GWAS uh, elements, 2,500 land races, some of those exotic mesa uh, uh, colored uh, types you saw. And in that panel, they looked at features like temperature, pre precipitation, wet day frequency, and they found a very good signal, signal that you can see here, so they found that uh, that, that candidate gene of interest uh, was identified via the GWAS uh, accessions uh, as, as uh, relevant to be optimal in a certain environment. Yeah? So we can then connect, and this is, is this actually connecting to drought was the question. And we could. The phenotypic data show this. The genotypic data show the, the graph below. Yeah? And you can imagine that now, you can go fancy, right? Fancy as well on generating data. Those agronomists here having 2,000, what is it? 2,700 data points, 2,700 trials, that's already fantastic, right? Here we're rapidly talking about huge amount of data. And I think it is another paradigm shift that scientists in the past, their art was probably creating the data and then interpreting them. That creation of data part is increasing very rapidly on a, on, a very, on a relative scale. It's getting easier and easier to get a lot of data. The question is how do we transform that data into learning, into information, and, it, and once we have the information from information to decision making and from decision making to the decision taking. Talking about collecting those data in order to take into account all those different future climate change impacts, there's a whole series of instruments that have been activated within the CIMIT research breeding programs, thanks to the physiology team, that goes from very precision elements, where you're happy with a few data, but very precise, all the way up to huge data collection by drones, airplanes, etc. And so how do we connect those different data streams and how do we mine them the best is a challenge. So I hope we have some mathematicians here, some statisticians, some engineers. This is now about robots, sensors. So we need to get agricultural interest uh, with the engineers uh, in, in, in Cornell. So you need to talk about them, that it's not only fun to eat and to have nice food, but they actually help, have to help us to produce that food. One of the examples that you cannot do this as one institution, but we have to use the power of collaboration. We have to use the power of, of, of multi-country information. And this needs to go above any politics, any policy interventions. This is about the global community coming together about a great issue like, for example, heat. And all these sites here are sites where nurseries or sets of potential future seeds of wheat are tested to see if they work. So you measure the power of the collective data that is generated here. And that's what CIMIT does, connecting and bringing together those global partners and bringing that knowledge out. So is it about CIMIT? Is it about Cornell? Is it about, I don't know, ICAR in, in India? Frankly speaking, it's not. 
It's about the collective power of bringing that data together to a, to a, through a network that decides to do something about, uh, uh, about this, uh, this issue. And we need to rapidly respond. And uh, you have a rapid responder here in the room, which is Ronnie. When he saw UG99, together with a team of people, it's kind of the COVID for wheat. No? All of a sudden, this rust disease came up, no wheat resistant to it. It's like COVID came in, and we don't know. Maybe some of you are resistant, but we don't know, are naturally resistant. It would be fun to know who of you are, because then we could probably understand a few things. But we, didn't know, we don't know. Same thing, the best we could do is to rapidly actually replace several of those varieties with resistant varieties. And that was a very huge success, success story that I hope you all know, because it was, again, the success of collaboration, but also the success of seeing an issue and responding very rapidly before it became a disaster. Now, the problem is, how do you get dollars for avoiding a disaster? I'm still struggling with that. How do you keep getting dollars for avoiding something that didn't happen? But we have constantly weed blast coming in. Fall army worm. If you are a farmer here in the US, you know about fall army worm. If you're a farmer in Mexico, you know about it. If you're sitting in Africa, you don't. But the fall army worm took a plane and it hit Africa and it was a disaster. Same maize lethal necrosis responses of the maize teams globally was all, and one of those other success stories. If we look at the seeds grown in Afghanistan, 75% come from Simit. Simit, once again, not the institution, but the network of wheat uh, institutions working with us. Ethiopia, 87% of the wheat. So if you take out the investment in those organizations, that what, that's what you're playing with. You're playing with the daily bread of these kind of countries. Making the seed is not enough. We have to generate the seed systems. We do a lot of work on seed systems, very successful work, collaborating with the private sector. A map, for example, here for uh, South Asia, so you, or for the whole South Asian uh, continent, so you see seed companies in Pakistan, Nepal, uh, uh, Bangladesh, maybe seed companies you didn't even know existed, seed companies in India, all working together to get those seeds to the farmers. Seeds per se are not enough. We need to put those seeds in a transformational environment so they give us the grain, right? And that means empowering whoever's plants and source, which is, the, which is the farmer. That means testing new and innovative, but also traditional no, uh, methods to understand how I can create the best agronomy, the best system, and the best transformation towards nutritious food. And integrate all the actors around that. So it's the great balancing act between social organizations, collective action, public sector, policies, adaptation, private sector, individual act action, technologies, and where is everybody sitting in this great balancing act. And to make it even more complex, this whole balancing act is not sitting in a linear process. It's not sitting in an engineer process. It is sitting in this very complex kind of graphs, which is your agri-food system. So we need double systems thinking. But at the same time, let's not get lost in complexity. We do need to get some results. We need to get stuff done. So there's always, even if it's a complex system, there are linear elements in that system. But we're probably moving more and more to this wicked problem state, which is a state where your problems are very high in uncertainty and very high in uh, value conflicts. So this is probably the site or the space where we are with the whole climate change question. How will we need to be today? So people in 2100 say, luckily in 2022, Cornell did what it did. Luckily, in 2022, CIMIT did what it did. 2,100, that's the scale we're talking about. Sounds far away, your kids will probably still be alive. Some of you will still be alive in 2,100. So it's not that far away. With that, we um, started experimenting in CIMIT with new action research, participatory action research that looks at the relevance for the final stakeholders that engages from the design of the research, and that is ready to adapt whenever it looks uh, necessary or it deems to be uh, necessary. And we started with a setup in a certain agroecology that looked a bit like this, very nice drawing. We have a platform. A platform is a controlled environment. It would be an experiment in Geneva, for example, where you have a very controlled experimental station with a long-term trial. 
We have on farm trials, and then from there you go to farmers applying it. But if you look at this, this is actually an engineer that made this drawing. If you, if you would have asked an artist to make this drawing, he would probably already have made it different. Because we basically took three elements, made a circle, and then some lines here. So it was still very transfer of technology thinking. Very technology focused. This is a drawing from 10 years ago. Very, cons and we were already happy. Very conservation agriculture, one technology approach. Very structural, if you see, very many structural elements. Very linear. And then when we draw what happened on, on, on site, it became a bit more messy. Because guess what? There's human being involved. And it's actually sitting more centric than uh, your nice structural, structural element. So the next step was, oh, this actually doesn't work like that. It's actually about brokering. It's actually about actor focus. It's actually not about the technology, but the outcome, sustainable intensification. It's about the network rather than a structure. It's about the dynamics of that network. So our next intent to better characterize what we're doing, I'm sorry, this, this, uh, oh, oh. yeah. So our next intent is this one. Still a bit showing where, where the sites are, because you probably want to see where the interventions are. Where sits Cornell, it's probably here. Basic research, platforms, control trials, but we want to take you more and more on this story here. On-farm trials, 20,000 of those. Can you plug them into your research thinking? Can you get PhD students working with farmers that apply the knowledge? But the most important thing is this thing here on the top, which is a network of actors that moves into that uh, space. And that uh, is a huge experiment per se. All those people do experiments daily, like you do. You probably try to do something different today. I hope at least one thing different a day, because otherwise life is boring. So you did, a, you did already one experiment today. Let's harvest uh, some of that uh, information. So the whole notion of citizen science, the whole notion of big data combined with structured data so that we can extract the information we want. So it's actually more and more about working in the nexus of energy, food, and water in a knowledge system where you recognize different knowledge streams from tacit to explicit, from implicit to embodied, from embodied to embedded and to established. And within that context, you have time, space, and actors, and very important, you have power dynamics. And you have not even started your research yet. Yeah? Don't forget that we want science to be neutral, but there are power dynamics around the design of our own science. How does such a system look like in Mexico? You have it here. Every red dot is a module. Every green dot is, is one of those application sites where we harvest data. And every blue dot is farmers just running with it, doing it. And we have minimal data of what they're doing, but not all the detailed controlled data. Outcome of that for the agronomists in the room, you want to see plants, you want to see yield, you want to see how good is this going. So you can see it here, left side conservation agriculture, right side conventional. Maize, maize taking away all the residue, plowing. Maize, wheat rotations, leaving the residue um, and not uh, plowing in the environment in Mexico City. Same environment in completely different in a tropical area, conservation agriculture versus uh, conventional. I'm going to take this one because I think the battery is flat. Oh, let's see if this is not, not working either. So. Yeah, can we see it now? So you, this is an other site where you can see um, the uh, same thing, Conservation Act left, conventional till it's right, Conservation Act world left, conventional right, Conservation Act culture left, conventional all under water. A few days later, it looks like this. So this is technologies that do climate change adaption, choose over time. That technology, this is yield, this is time. Something dropped off my slide. Um, so the green one seems to be the best. It's stop, it's less variable. The red one seems to be less stable, very traditional. But guess what? Surprise. High yields may not be the primary focus of the farmers. So if you really want to look at adaptive uh, uh, agronomic production systems, we need to look at different elements. Because maybe yield is not the base on which farmers take their decision. It's maybe labor, it's maybe markets, it's maybe land appropriation, it's maybe speculation, it's maybe farming style, etc., etc. 
But also, if we are creating those new systems, we can not only look at yield. If we have very, very high yields at costs of greenhouse gas emissions, it's kind of killing yourself, right? It is eating very nice and at the same time producing a toxin uh, that's going to kill you. So well, why would we do that? So there needs to be other elements before we take a decision. What is happening with greenhouse gas emissions? Can we take N2O out of that story? Can we understand what those emissions are, how they are moving? Can we use sensors to optimize uh, some of those uh, elements? Can we use compost, organic matter? Can we do circular economy and look, and uh, I see Rebecca in the room, and look at what comes out of us? And can we use it for something? Very, very interesting uh, ideas. Maybe the cities can produce fertilizer. Why not? So most farmers, uh, sorry, I think that's a replication, sorry. Are we going backwards? That's usually not a good thing to do. Okay, here we are. So, um, no, I, did I skip? no, there we are. So technologies for climate change, carbon sequestration, obviously, is that carbon sitting there? How is it sitting there? Is it moving, but still there or not? How do we influence that? by the practices uh, we, uh, we use. Can we do systematic innovations for sustainable cropping system? Can we change the way we crop? Can we use uh, different uh, durations of crops so that we can fit in another, another crop uh, by, with the right machine? Can we buffer and get out of some of the heat and so the crop is uh, sufficiently advanced? Can we mature it easily so that it doesn't affect uh, an end of the, an end of the crop uh, hail or an end of the crop uh, cold, can we create that extra window for that mung bean that we need to have a healthy, a healthy diet? But also, can we help those, uh, uh, those uh, people living in the city of uh, New Delhi? If you've ever been at a certain point in New Delhi, it's, it's very difficult to breathe because there's a lot of smoke, a lot of smoke, and the smoke is coming from the surrounding areas, farmers burning their straw. So can we actually do something instead of putting the fields on fire, can we actually put a bit of fire into farmers to do uh, those things differently and at the same time our maybe cities are uh, willing to pay for that through carbon credits because they want to breathe cleaner, cleaner air. There are options that uh, are actually doing that, that, that carbon capturing, but can we then measure it? Because right now we're actually estimating it. So there's going to come a point where people are going to say, well, you're saying this, but can we measure, can we put sensors everywhere? Can we, how are we really going to account for, for what we are doing? Especially if it becomes a business, right? You don't want to be giving money for something you imagine. You want to make sure it's real. So I think we have a shift from business as usual uh, uh, um, uh, towards a business unusual within a usual business. So we need to zoom the focus. We need to not reinvent the wheel, what's already there, let's use it. We need to test and validate under specific circumstances. We need to demonstrate with clarity what is the objective. If we are not clear about the objective, we're already in a very different conversation. If I don't tell you what my objective is, if we don't tell what the ideal world is, it's going to be a very difficult conversation. Analyze and reanalyze data. We analyze data and then we probably put them away because I did my experiment well, but maybe the objective changed. So can we reanalyze those data under a different paradigm? And generalization in the world, in life, is usually very dangerous. So I'm at the top of the hour, and this was going to be the moment where I was going to close off my seminar and open it for Q&A. Were it not that there has been a recent development globally, which I think we need to talk about. We recently have the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Why do we need to talk about it as Mace Wheat Center? Why do we need to talk about it as CALS uh, seminar or Global Development Seminar? Because there's five top producers of wheat. US, Canada, Russia, and the Ukraine. And those top producers export to a couple of countries. You can see it on this map. Russia is exporting to the countries that you can see highlighted here. The Ukraine is exported to the, exporting to these countries here. Now, many of those countries actually are wheat, potentially wheat reducing countries, but under an efficiency paradigm, they are importing that wheat. 
You probably have seen the recent news as well. Russia, as the Ukraine has declared independently if they're going to harvest or not. I think they're, especially in Ukraine, busy with, with, with other things. But, and, the, and the crop is in the field. It's almost ready to be harvested. But even if they harvest, both countries have said they will not export as an initial measure to make sure they don't know what's coming to make sure that the population can be fed. That's going to have an impact on price. That's going to have a, a, a ripple effect. On the other hand, fertilizer is also produced, a lot of it, nitrogen fertilizer, in Russia. So that will not be available on the market as it was before. And we all know the impact on wheat, on maize, of not uh, sufficient availability of nitrogen. Uh, that's going to be an immediate knockoff on the yield. So there's going to be two effects. An effect of non-availability through those countries. An effect on production in the rest of the world. And then that means an effect on availability to the countries that would buy, but also immediately an effect on price in general, which will be an effect on other countries. We know from history that uh, price of food can generate conflict. If we analyze the Arab Spring, it was several factors, but one, let's say, of the three to five key factors was the cost of food. Now, in this country, I was listening to the news, and you're discussing a lot the cost of energy. And that's, uh, of course, because those two countries also export a lot of oil, a lot of energy. And you feel the price of energy dire almost directly because there's less intermediate steps. Well, the cost of food, it takes a while before it has an impact on your supermarket. It takes less of a while before it has an impact on the pocket of those that where supermarkets are shorter, that actually take the grain and turn it into bread, which is many of those, of those countries. But still, it takes a while. But when it hits, it's going to hit hard, and it's going to hit for sure. And we already see that those countries that are in blue here, already today, before this happened, they were uh, hunger hotspots. So they were already at the margin of being able to feed their population. What is the direct impact? The direct impact is increasing prices. And you can see how prices of wheat are going up. Maize will be dragged with that. Rice, soybean automatically goes uh, uh, with uh, those prices. So we see prices going up today, day after day after day. So what do we need to do? We need short-term and long-term solutions that go hand in hand. Immediate crisis relief. So yes, we need to look at the World Food Program and how they intervene. But hopefully, they can intervene in such a way that while they intervene, they also create the resilience for the future. Hopefully, we can use the data of their intervention. Hopefully, the type of intervention is such a way that farmers can produce the food locally later on instead of destabilizing some of that production. Hopefully, if they do that, they can give uh, drought-resistant wheat varieties. They can maybe promote new production systems so that we can reactivate that production element. That means you, us, Simit, Cornell, others online, we need to be there. We need to call the executive director of the World Food Program now to say we are ready to collaborate to do this smarter and better. Second, we need to keep going on sending the right varieties and innovations. We need to maintain this system because if on top of that UG99 hits, where would we be? And we have barely invested enough in the research world to keep going, to keep fighting the new diseases. So we need to invest to keep this system going, while on the longer term, we invest in transforming from efficiency to resilience. It may make no sense to produce in certain countries because it's not efficient. But if you look at it from a resilience standpoint, it makes sense. So we need to shift that paradigm. What we cannot do is say, I have this system here. I'm going to create this new system. I switch this system off, and I switch this system on, because that means at least for a second complete darkness. So we need to keep this moving while we transform here and slowly let it take over. Seems like an impressive, undoable task. What are you going to do about it? Well. It is an impressive task, but it's not an undoable task. Uh, so undoable that the next slide doesn't come up. Okay, it's not an undoable task. We did it before. If 50 years ago this man would have said it's an undoable task, 
we would not be here. If he wouldn't have the leadership and invite others like Ronnie to say, come with me, it's not an enjoyable task, we not, would not be sitting here. We have created peace through agriculture. We just need to do it again. And I'm not saying, let me be crystal clear, I'm not saying we need to do what he did. He would slap you in the face if you would say that. Not literally, you know, but with words. Um, because that's not what it's about. It's about the same transformational, bold but not reckless decision to do something about it before it is too late. That's the call. We have done it together with another of those situations. We came together and we made a strong coalition of the willing with the Borla Global Rust Initiative. We went out. We showed decision makers, if you don't do something now, this is going to spread and it's going to be a disaster. We need to get out. And if only, we need to do it for the simple reason of being relevant. We are in exercise in CIMIT to make an excellence in science strategy. If we put that strategy out in two, in a year, let's say, and we're going to start bragging about it. You are making a strategy, Project 2030, what's the new vision of Cornell? You're going to go out in a year and brag about it. If we don't do anything today, people are going to say, great. Great that you are occupied making a new strategy while we needed you on the ground doing stuff now. So now you come saying you're going to save the world? You should have saved it whenever it's still time, time to save it. So just for the sake of being relevant, we need to do something. And if you look around, I am sorry, it's very scary. But the day we realize there is no others, right? The day you realize this is the meeting, this is the team that needs to come together. There is no other team out there that's going to do it for us. We better come together and get the, 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 the job done. So I hope to leave from here by the end of the week, together with many, many colleagues, many, many friends, with a clear plan that we can go out and say, we can do something about it. We can do something immediately. We need to keep the system going. We need to show those countries where they can grow wheat, how we can buffer this medium-term piece. And we are ready to start to shift from efficiency to resilience. There's huge potential in this room. And this phrase was never this relevant. But you cannot eat potential. And very soon, some people are going to have to eat. So I hope we're going to give them more than just the potential. Thank you very much. Uh, hi. I would like to congratulate you for the beautiful presentation. I'm sorry, I cannot hear it up to here. Give it a knock and there we go. Yeah, I'll remove my mask. So first of all, I would like to congratulate you for the brilliant presentation. It was really insightful to hear and learn uh, all the interesting things that uh, CIMIT is doing. And my question is also related to the COVID crisis. I know in the seed production uh, system, it takes a long, a long time to come up with new varieties to test them and, and, and so forth. Uh, but is there a possibility to sort of shorten this period so that we are able to respond to this emerging crisis? They did with the vaccines. So what about the, with, uh, with seeds and, and, and food crops? Is it possible to do that? Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, there is, because we have done that. We have done it with UG99. We have done it with maize lethal necrosis. We have done it, but we have not done it with some other diseases, like, for example, wheat blast. And why? Because nobody was interested to. And what I think is it should not just be a matter of people standing up and shouting loud enough so that you can get the resources and that's not the one you respond to. This should be part of investments that are made. There should be a bucket that says, and for anything else you need to do to make this work. But that's very scary, right? Because you will not have, have the, uh, the argument as the recipient to say, well, I didn't, that was, I mean, sorry, but you didn't pay for that piece, so uh, it didn't work well. It was your fault. You should have paid for it. If there is that bucket saying, and everything else you need to do to make it work, it's a bit scary. 
because that means the accountability is 100% clear that we need to make it work. So yes, there have been examples of mace lethal necrosis, UG99, uh, full army warm, but I think we can do better, we can do faster, and we can do it more constant so it's not a constant of putting out fires, yeah? Thank you. Is there a question online? Yes. I can, uh, yeah. There's a question online from uh, Michael Snow who is asking, should we be so focused on maize and wheat only? I kind of know the answer, but he's saying, what about other perennial crops uh, that could be important to feeding the world? Yes. When you are the director of the Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, <laughs> you need to be focused on maize and wheat. But, uh, but no. And, and if I gave the wrong impression, uh, I hope that you could see in some of the slides, that was not about maize and wheat. Those systems interventions, those agri-food systems, those hubs, that's crop agnostic. It's about individuals producing a healthy diet, and a healthy diet involves more than maize and wheat. So we're not gonna save the world or feed or nourish people sustainably with maize and wheat alone. But also, let's get away out of those kind of, and allow me to say it, cheap, discussions, dichotomies, which I sometimes feel they actually distract from taking the responsibility and accountability to do something. Because while we're quarreling about what it should be, we better should say, this is what we want, healthy diet. What does that mean? What is a healthy diet for Ethiopia? Can we agree on that? If we agree on that, let's work backwards and let's then make it work and let's then work on it. And that maybe means producing le on less land, more maize, so that you can fulfill that and open space for beans, sorghum, groundnut. Maybe sorghum is what we need to bring in the mix to respond quickly, to respond quickly to some of the needs. We will have to analyze it. So very clear, no, not only about mason wheat. Uh, I very much appreciated your, uh, your lecture and especially the call to action, which I feel like is sometimes lacking in, in speeches. But um, I wanted to ask, so you talked about resilience uh, versus efficiency. Um, which I feel like is something, a concept that a lot of people have kind of been floating around but not spelling out as explicitly as you are. How do we convince people who are focused on the efficiency of the now, right, the, you know, this year's profit margins? How do you convince them and, you know, to focus on resilience? And what's maybe some of the, the kind of knowledge structures to, to prove that, right? Like how important it is? What's the dollar amount? Yeah. So there's two strategies. Either you turn resilience into efficiency or into a decision of efficiency, or you make people aware about the importance of resilience. Let me give two, two examples. If you look at business continuity in a value chain, yeah, then there's insurances for that, to insure your company so that it can keep working, and if something happens that you have an insurance. If you look at that and you, can, you say, and if those insurance companies would tell to a company, your insurance is going to be more expensive if your value chain is not resilient. If your value chain has a higher risk of breaking through because you're only buying it from one side, shipping it through one shipping route to your company, that's going to cost you more because the probability of that breaking down is higher than if you do that, but you, you also do local sourcing, you do it from small farmers, from medium farmers, and from big farmers. And I'm not saying shut down the big farmers. Big farmers produce volume. It's very homogeneous. If you shut those down, you're in, in trouble. I'm not saying only source from smallholder farmers. Resilience comes from the combination of different types. You see what I mean? Of different size, because they respond differently to pressures. You see what I mean? If you want a big impact, do it with the big farmers. If they take a different decision, wow, huge impact. If you want to, uh, to, to do different things, go with small. So it's that whole range. So if you would make that insurance more expensive, it becomes an efficiency decision for the CFO of the company, but it's going to directly impact the bottom line. So that's one strategy. How do we do plays where the resilience gets a price that then becomes an efficiency decision? So you don't change the decision making per se of the system. That's one way. That we probably need, and that's probably the immediate easiest way. That we need to combine with visualizing resilience. We do take those decisions individually daily. When you imagine, when you visualize, uh, uh, the resilience. It's kind of crossing a street, yeah? You can cross the highway by going like this, 
or you can cross the highway by walking a little bit further, take the bridge over the highway, come down, and why are you not taking the most efficient decision? You're making a resilience decision, right? Because you want to get a life at the other side of the, of the road. So you are willing to invest more and to create a resilience path. In a, this is a very simple example. Resilience people would say this is the worst example ever, but I'm, I'm trying to, to, to make a simile. So you're willing to pay more, you're willing to put more energy because you can see the cost, the potential cost, even if it's not a real cost. You can see the potential cost, which is huge, if the crisis happens. You don't know if it's going to happen. Maybe you're fast enough and you run between the cars and you're fine, but it can happen. So it's about visualizing that potential cost that is high enough so you're willing to invest in the, in the short run. We're really bad, really bad at showing, at telling the story of that potential cost at the system's perspective. So that's where we need artists, storytellers. That's why insurance companies have actuaries. Actuaries, their job is to paint a picture of the risk and the probability and the, let's bring them in. Can they look at our uh, agri-food systems and describe that picture and then maybe we're willing to take different decisions uh, in that sense? Yeah, we um, have uh, Sorry. two final questions. One is online from KV Raman who wants you to comment on gene editing and uh, GM potential and uh, discussion on policy. And there's another question here. In we can take one of them. Yeah. And thanks to the students. I know you need to go to another class. So thanks, thanks for being here. Yes, thank you. My, my question is really about the uh, Grand Challenge project looking at the periodic table food. Looking at, at, the, sorry? at the periodic table food that's being done by um, Rockefeller Foundation and a combination of um, the different um, research institutions. And your talk about looking at future problems and solving them today. I, I'm wondering if you're considering um, putting some of the, your, your work that is in progress um, to submitting it to that um, uh, periodic table analysis so that in future, if it turns out to be what we, we need, then it's already incorporated in that and if it's a possibility, I, thanks. I don't know all the details about that effort, so sh shame on me, I don't have the full information, but I already say right now, yes, why not? If there's anything there that can test and give us some insights to learn more, absolutely. But, but hopefully you can send me some more info uh, because I don't have the details on that, that effort. I think, uh, could, yeah, go ahead. I think people, oh, okay, we had a question on GM and gene editing and the limitations and policy, and I think Okay. <laughs> Let me tell the, the, the gene editing and, 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 and transgenic discussion. Let's 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 discuss that. Happy to happy to yeah. do that. Also, uh, there are several scientists in CIMED that are way more knowledgeable about that. So I can also connect uh, the, the whoever asked the question to that resource. So so uh, just say one thing. Yes. Yeah. It's on. You just have to get it really close. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Rob. <laughs> Rob, I'm excited about your uh, efficiency to resiliency uh, concept here. It seems like so many reasons uh, to do that. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could sort of elaborate on the main elements. You've given an analogy for it, for getting from hither to thither, but you've got diversification, circularity, redundancy, um, decentralization, and possibly general shift towards more agroecological production syndromes generally. And I'm, I'm wondering, looking as CIMIT and then more generically, how do you, like, if you're going to pound the top three, or, or is that stupid? And you, I mean, it is stupid, but so what's the whole laundry list and what are the, <laughs> what are the main angles that you would take as an institution to, to make that shift, not at the margins, but more centrally? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question. And I think it is by asking the, 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 the right question. I think already by asking the question, what do we need to do today to be relevant in 2100, do you actually take the efficiency out of the strategic planning question? Because efficiency is usually very, very short term. And when you look longer term, almost automatically that resilience piece comes into that. So I think that, that, that's, top number, that's number one, because like you said, the, the laundry list is going to be very, very long on, on where and how we can do this. But I think that's number one bringing climate change as a central driver on how we should look at the innovations, how we should look at the research, how we should, is another strategy probably to get there because climate change inherently is going to change the paradigm and we, we think we know, but we actually don't fully know. So it's also probably going to bring it there. 
let me also say what we will not do. It doesn't mean throwing everything out that we're doing today and all of a sudden running to that, to that other thing. It doesn't also mean that the processes per se always need to go. What I mean is you want your purchase done fast, correctly, immediately, well done, finished. That's, a, that's an effective process. You want an effective process and then you want to make it efficient. So it doesn't mean resilience has to be everywhere at every time at every moment and you throw out the ways you were doing all your business what i mean is it needs to slowly come in there without shutting down the, the, the so we what what i would not recommend is let's now shut down this system we have and we're going to now create this other thing because that would be that would be very unresilient am i, am I wrong to see those three things that you just said as how or why yes it's how, more the how know what, what I, I think it is the what but, but I, I, I'm not, it's, it, it's going to have to lead to the what. But I'm not going to prescribe to all those actors in, in the network what that what is, is going to be. It is probably going to be about drought-resistant varieties. It is going to be about broad adaptability of the varieties. Or not, but let's have that discussion. It is going to be about uh, 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 how you do farmer-centered research. So, so you take that stakeholder centrally but i think everybody needs to go through that thinking process and it would be a mistake as director general to try to be prescriptive of what that means for for because you know that we, actually if you go to the thinking process you com will come up with the what yourself probably quite quite efficiently so i think that the the why getting that impregnated uh the how so putting a few tactics that can then result in in operational change Makes sense. Thank you.